because in the end, true courage comes from your relationship with God and no other source. And so if you can just bear that in mind. <laughs> Is there any other questions for Mary? Um, is it a question to fire away? Just a, a practical question. I understand recently you left where you were living, moved to the what seems like totally remote place, out of the world, to be with AJ. Could you just describe to me in simple terms how you got to the point where you gave up your life, moving with this man? It took a long time, well, it took a year. And I really resonated with the whole teaching when I got over my anger and really listened to it all. Um, and I felt that finally I have I've been looking at different spiritual paths and things quite casually, but all of my life. And um, I finally everything sort of clicked for me when in the teaching. Jesus thing was the stumble block. Um, and so I felt passionate about it um, pretty much immediately. Um, and AJ and I would spend hours discussing it, talking to lots of people about it, even when we were travelling first. Um, it took me a long time to work through the resistance of actually deciding to do it. Um, and it took I think I needed to really um, remember my relationship with God, which is something that I have never really focused on very much in this life. I've had some strange feelings about what, who is God, and is there a God, or is this one? There's like a lot of, sort of things to work through there. Uh, and a lot of fears about abundance, and um, it's ridicule. I have a lot of fears about that. But, so you're not talking about your soulmate connection then. You're not talking about actually wanting to live with the man that you've grown to love. Well, are talking about your relationship with God that moved you towards your passion to teach. No, it's, no. No? I'm sorry. No, but I was saying that, but you're right. It's not just that. <laughs> um, there was God, there was AJ, there was... <laughs> The teaching was there. I don't know if it is there even yet. But um, I realised that I wanted to have a fully open and emotionally connected relationship with AJ. I needed to live in my emotions and do and connect with God. And, and yeah, I decided that why not live with him? No, I wanted to. I wanted to do really much, yeah. But I had, I had to. What I was saying, I had to work through all of those fears to get to that place. Because very often I would feel very connected with AJ um, and very in love. But then there would be a lot of fear stepping away of it. A lot of fear about my future, my career, my family, everything. And suddenly a lot of my desire would fall, fall away. And so it took a long time to work through those fears. And to finally, because also it affects my identity, Jen, like, it's not just a guy I meant. It, to accept him is to accept his identity and my own. And that's why it's still a real work in progress for me, because... So you feel like you jumped off the cliff? Yeah, really. totally. Totally. And, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> But it's awesome. It's really good. Just jump off the cliff, everyone. It's amazing. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. It's really good. It last time. It's really good. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Have you got any memory of how you two met in the first century? I mean, it seems like you had a really 
in our life and then all of a sudden you meet this wonderful man. Have you got any ideas? I don't have a memory of the event, but I have a memory of emotionally what happened. It's quite overwhelming. Yeah. And being overwhelmed and similar to some feelings I have now of just this beautiful love that I've never experienced and this beautiful acceptance of being as a person that I have never ever experienced. And I have some beautiful memories of a great friendship and deep relationship. I have some feelings about that being very brief, which is sad for me. details about our first century life in order to try to satisfy you. But in the end, for many of you, that still will not satisfy you until you start seeing the love that you reflect. Um, and, 
And as we grow in love, you see more and more of that love reflected. And then you start looking at an issue a bit more seriously, perhaps, about doing your own work in love too. So don't be afraid about asking questions about our life, but don't be surprised if those questions are not answered in the way or manner that you expect them. myself not measuring up to that to that and that I used what I used to be. And so I have a lot of deep shame about that to work through and that's affecting my relationship with God and being a one with God again. And so while I feel those emotions it's very difficult for me to even accept a compliment like you really wanting to give. Um, but the the issue for me is that I'm not here to, like all of us have, have a purity of soul, all of us have that, and it's just a matter of connecting to that and allowing ourselves to develop emotionally so that any impurity is released. And the experience I'm going through now is having this terrible feeling of having all these impurities that I've never had before. And so I understand the difficulty of facing the truth of that itself that many of you are, are, are having. Um, but if you can just allow that process to occur, but I, I just want to make sure that you don't glorify me in any way because um, because I, in my own eyes, I'm still not even worthy to be me. Um, so I understand completely how any of you would feel that I'm not worthy to be me either. Um, so that, that's, that's some of the emotions that I'm moving through at the moment. Yeah. This uh, self-shame thing is pretty hard, isn't it? Yeah. Uh, like, I think it's easy, well, maybe it's easy, I don't know, a lot of people seem to get really caught up. I was quite done on this thing. And um, I really think um, if you look at the quality of the teaching and use the teaching in your life, then, um, you know, the proofs in the pudding, as it were. I thought the proof was in the eating of the pudding. <laughs> Sometimes, for some people, it's a good diversion away from our emotions to really get into this alien guy, pick him apart, see, hmm, I don't know about that thing, don't know, oh, okay, don't have to listen. And really, um, I feel like at times saying to people, why don't you try it? Try it for a week, try it for a month. And if it doesn't work for you, go, go on your way and, and that's fine. But I haven't met many people who have done that and Thank you. 
Just there with your hand. Now, in the first century, um, like you were Jesus and you were Master and then now you're AJ, are you, are you wanting are you wanting to be called Jesus and to teach us Jesus? Probably not. Or um, are you okay with just being called AJ? You're sort of continuing your teaching as, as AJ? Because I, I totally appreciate the teaching. It's, it's, it is a wonderful thing. Um, but a lot of people think they have a problem with you coming across as Jesus. Um, so are you fine with just being called AJ? Yeah. Do you know what I'm trying to say? Um, I'm fine being called anything. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I suppose the issue is that who do I resonate with? Like, many of you have the viewpoint that I'm the reincarnation perhaps of Jesus, but, but the feeling for me is that I am who I am. And I've been one person in my life. And I was born Yeshua, and uh, that was my name, and that feels the most resonant name for me now. Um, and that's and the reason why is because it's the name I was called for two thousand years. Um, you know, most people call that Jesus now. Um, the truth is that like I I'm more interested in whether you listen to the truths I'm teaching and apply them than you are than I am in you even um, accepting or whatever you call me. However I do know that at some point in your future progression there will be an emotion you will need to work through about this question. And the reason why you have to work through this emotion is it's about God having the... Having the um, God is allowed to make her choices. And many of us don't respect that. Many of us feel that we should... that God should do certain things rather than... Um, rather than God, what God actually has done. And one of the things God has done is this, uh, this man who sits in front of you, he chose to, to become a messenger of truth. Now, that choice resonated with my own heart's choice to, to, to actually follow through on, on that decision. In other words, I allowed that to be a burning desire within me as well. And it doesn't really matter what my name is. All that matters is that you understand that the truths that you're hearing are not my truths. And, and I know that many people will look back and say a discussion like this and say, oh, I've heard of this before, you know. Yeah, that person said it was this truth and that person says it was that. Yeah, it was always God's truth. But again, as, as I said in the first century, as Mary just stated, it's the fruitage of the truth that will prove to you whether it's the truth or not. So look at the fruitage of all these other truths that you see and what have they created and then put this truth into action in your own life and then look at the fruitage of this truth and what it produces. Look at, look at what actually happens when you put it into practice in your own life. So I don't, it doesn't matter to me if you, if you accept I'm Jesus or not, but I do know that at some point in the future you will know the answer to that question in your own heart and you won't need to ask it. In terms of who I am, of course, um, I didn't want to be who I'm saying I am. Um, I know as well as you that just my saying that creates huge amounts of disturbances emotionally in people and also huge amounts of the desire to reject what I'm saying to them. However, one issue that I've had to face through this process, just like I had to face in the first century, was that I had to come to speak the truth about myself as well. And so this is just the truth about myself. In the first century, um, it took me, it, I was over 20 years of age before I actually saw that the Messiah that I was personally hoping for in my own life, because of what I'd read from prophecies or from mediumship, if you like, was actually myself. And then it took me another 10 years to come to terms with that emotion of what that meant. Like that, that I was the person that was foretold in the Bible and in the prophets, in the, first, in the books of the prophets, um, who was foretold to be the Messiah, who would, who would actually be the messenger of truth to the world. And, 
and it took me a long time to come to terms with that emotionally in the first century. And, uh, and it's taken me a long time to come to terms with the same issue right now. Um, and it's uh, one of my, per you could say it's one of my personal emotional disturbances that I've been to work through. I certainly, people who have often accused me of wanting power or wanting authority or wanting to be special or whatever, and I tell you, I tell you they have no idea of the emotions I've had to process to get to the point where I could actually say in front of people who I am, and they have no idea of the amount of times I've wanted to run away from this whole process. So it's certainly not a desire within me to, to do that for that reason. But what I had to do was actually come to accept who I am from the point of view of receiving more divine love from God. And uh, I found that if I didn't accept who I was, then I would no longer receive divine love. And I felt cut off from God. And, uh, and so I've had to come to accept the truth, not just, not just know the truth, but actually accept the emotion inside myself about who I am. And at some stage, all of you will have to do that too, unfortunately. And I say unfortunately because my emotion at the moment is I'm sorry that I'm not the person that's as good as what you expect. But, but that's, I can't do anything about that. I am just who I am. And, and the truths that you hear, I can reassure you they're not my truths, but again, that's something you'll have to come to do and determine yourself. Okay. I'd like to sort of reassure you that I feel that um, I don't know whether 99.999% of the people in this room feel like I do. You are fully yourself, so you, what's it, what can I say? You fully do come up to our expectations. I mean, we, we, we don't expect some, for someone to be perfect. I mean, no, no one is absolutely perfect. And I think that we probably think we demand a lot of herself, as though we're not going to accept you for who you are. And I accept you for who you are, and I'd like everybody else to accept you for who you are. You raise that hand. There you are. <laughs> That's all. The issue isn't isn't cheering me up. <laughs> the issue oh. is that. Um, um, the issue is that um, I, I have a lot of uh, sh shame about myself as I am. And if you can imagine um, having like a, a, a feeling of perfection all of your life for 2,000 years, and then having a period of life where you feel you're terribly imperfect, um, you will probably begin to understand the extent of that shame. And it's an emotion that I'm working through now. And, and uh, so I'm enjoying working through the emotion because I know that once this shame leaves me, then I can be who I am properly. Uh, and it's actually the shame that's uh, creating my distance uh, from God at the moment. So, um, but it's nice of you to say, uh, but um, you know, obviously I still need to work through this emotion, this emotion that I'm feeling. I just wanted to comment, and I'm not trying to <laughs> but as someone who now lives with AJ, I can say that he is someone who practices what he preaches. He, I have never seen anyone so dedicated to what they believe life is about, and he is quite hard on himself in that he doesn't give himself a moment of rest. If there's an emotion, it just hung away, just the blood. <laughs> so I, 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 and believe me, I had a pretty strong radar for what this guy up to, and um, I have found it. <laughs> He's he is living on he, what he is, you know, being who he is, and living in the truth of what he's encouraging all of us to do at every moment. Hey, Jay, um, I've taken in what you, you've said, and um, obviously because of the, 
your name and your identity, there, there, are, there are other issues because other people are involved. But as you were describing that, it seems that there's a, there's a form of parallel in what you're going through with what each of us is going through as an individual in that we sense who we are and we feel that we're so different from what this worldly form is. And there's such a longing to to be that and, and to experience ourselves as that. And presumably, that the difficulty in accepting who we are it is creating various obstacles in our environment. And what, what Brian was saying for those of you who couldn't hear was that um, that my feelings of self shame about myself and not being the person who I really am really does mirror your own journey a lot in the sense that you will have a feeling in your own self of your own soul and how good it can be if you like but also have a feeling of all the errors that are there and, and feel this great disharmony between who you currently are and who you could be and uh, and so you know that is an emotion that I've never understood before in my life until now. Um, in my first century life, I didn't really understand that emotion because I hadn't experienced that. In the first century, I always felt I was the best I could be, um, and I was never, I never had those feelings of unworthiness or, or, or sadness about knowing that there's better within me but not being. There. And it's only been in this life that I've actually experienced that. So there's a, a lot of reasons why I've chosen to experience these experiences that uh, I've gone through in this life. And that's one of them. We finished with questions from Mayor. I'd like to say some things about Mary. <laughs> um, the last year has been a very difficult year for Mary, uh, as you possibly could imagine, but unless you're actually experiencing it, of course it's very, very difficult to know. And, um, you know, it's very, very difficult, firstly, to kind of accept and a identity of all of these emotions within yourself that you weren't ever conscious of before. It's also very, very difficult to go through traumatic events with friends and family and other and other people as a result of your choices. And it's also very difficult to actually come to terms with the fact that this this crazy man that she's interested in might might actually be speaking the truth and and so, you know, there's been lots of emotions that she's had to face in all those areas. And, um, I just feel so glad that she's actually worked through a lot of those things emotionally. And I also feel that no matter what she chooses to do, even if it's not to be with me, um, I'm just so glad that, that I know who she is again. You know? The very first emotion that I felt uh, when I first met her was, uh, again, I mean, was um, I was lying in bed in her parents' house. Uh, she was upstairs, and, uh, and I'm just shaking my head going, if she's not my soulmate, then I'm in deep trouble. Like, because I could feel just how much I felt for her. Um, but I could also feel that like, if I still had a lot of injuries over then, you know, it was possible that I could be attracted to this girl as an injury. Obviously, over the last year, and um, um, I've, I've just felt from the day from the day I met her who she is. But in the last year, I've tried to not project that at Mary, but just allow her to come to her own choices and decisions. And this is something that's really important for you, perhaps, to do too in your own relationships, is to start really allowing those that are with you and, and those that you're in a relationship with even right now to come to their own decisions and own choices and allow them to do that and own your own emotions in that process. So during the time that Mary wouldn't speak to me, um, 
I had lots of them I used, obviously. Many of you heard some of them in some of my talks, right? And I had to work through all of those things emotionally. And so my suggestion to you is to do the same in your own relationships. Live in truth in them, but deal with the emotions from them. And if you can do that, then you will eventually work through the masculine and feminine injuries that you have, and you will also be able to attract the person who is your, who is your perfect partner, who is the soulmate. But it won't be perfect in the way that you're thinking of it right now for them. It'll be perfect in that it'll, it'll get rid of both of your injuries very rapidly if you allow that to occur. And, uh, and being with Mary has triggered many more of the injuries that I had within myself that I had to work through. And uh, as a result, um, I worked through lots of different emotions and feelings. And I tried to be with you as open as possible as I could during working through those feelings as well, so that so that you could get some kind of idea of yourself of what it's going to mean for you to do that. Now I know that many of you are perhaps feeling there should be an easier way than this. <laughs> many uh, have been emailing me recently saying I found this easier way to do with your emotions. <laughs> And I can assure you that while um, you may discover some easier ways, uh, anything that helps you deal with causal emotion is the most important thing. And what I'm finding for many people is that they are not dealing with their causal emotions. They are dealing with their effect-based emotions. And so my suggestion is to, to allow yourself to start looking at the causal emotions and many of them will be things you don't like seeing. And this is like this is why I feel the way I feel about myself at the moment, because many of the things in myself I don't like seeing. And it's those emotions that are the hardest emotions for you to work through. Because you don't want to see them. And you don't certainly want to process them. It's the times when you're unloving with others the other times when you don't really want to process the emotion. So that's why I wanted to have this coming up discussion of lessons in love with you. Because there are many times that we're skipping over lessons in love in our emotional work. And I'd like to discuss that with you next. Now, is there any uh, more questions for Mary at all? Or do you feel, uh, I don't know if Mary feels like staying with me and having this discussion with you? This uh, discussion coming up now which we might do after a break. Um, this discussion coming up now is going to be very much focusing on some of Mary's favourite favorite information. And the reason why is because one of the things that we see quite often is people can become so embroiled in their own emotional processing work that they stop reflecting love rather than looking at everything from the perspective of love. You see, when you... But for instance, let's say you're embroiled in an emotion which is nobody gives me anything. Let's say that's an emotion. Now, when you have that emotion within you and you're not actually re releasing it, you're going to start expecting everyone around you to give you everything. Does that make sense? And in that, in that moment, it's going to be very, very tempting for you not to be loving. And you're saying, I'm doing my emotional work, I'm doing my emotional work. But in reality, you're actually damaging yourself and what's around you in that, in that state. And so this is why I want to cover this next section about lessons in love, because what we need to do in our own emotional processing work is stop damaging the people around us. And stop damaging ourselves. We need to just feel the emotions. And so that's why I want to discuss this lessons in love with you. But we'll have a break, I think, and maybe make it a half an hour, shall we? Uh, so if we can come back about three-ish, sharp, and then we'll get started. By the way, one thing I'd like to mention is that this discussion won't finish today because there's ten lessons in love I want to discuss with you, and uh, we'll probably only get to do three or four or maybe five today, and we'll be doing the others tomorrow. Let's talk about some lessons in love. All of you have a handout. Notice on the handout, it's four pages long. And, uh, 
there's 10 lessons in there. I'd love, but before we begin, I want to talk about why we're discussing this. One of the main... I Still got to work through that emotion. And one of the main reasons why I've raised this issue now is that uh, the majority of people find it very, very difficult to work through their emotions and still stay face, face to face. And also a lot of people on the divine love path seem to start thinking that they don't have to learn lessons in natural love. That they don't have to actually understand how love works on the divine love path. But remember how, remember what we've just said right from the beginning. Remember, what are these spheres things? What are they? Levels of love. So, uh, and these boundaries are boundaries in love. Okay, so everything's about love. Now remember the first six spheres are the path to perfected natural love. Okay. And then above that you're perfecting your areas of the mind love. So so if that's the case, and let's say the earth is in sphere number one, that means that as people on earth we've got a lot to learn about love, doesn't it? And we don't want to differentiate between, oh, is this a natural love lesson or is this a divine love lesson so much? We just want to learn the lessons, don't we, of love. So a lot of the lessons of love are actually the first, if you can think about it this way, the first six levels of our development, a lot of the lessons of love are going to be about natural love and not divine love. All right. Now, if that's the case, then we've got to learn about these lessons in natural love, what they actually are, what are some basic principles in love. Now, there are literally hundreds of lessons in love that we can learn. But there are 10 basic principles that if you learn them, a lot of these other lessons will just make sense to you quite rapidly. And particularly if you learn them emotionally. Right. So you can see in the introduction that I've pointed out that you could choose to learn all of these lessons that I'm going to present to you over the coming day in a bit. You could choose to learn them all here. And you could choose to put them all into practice by actually thinking about it, working through the issue, thought with thoughts, working out how you're going to do that better, and actually putting that into practice. You could choose to do it that way if you want. Now my suggestion is to not do that. My suggestion is to do it the divine love way. The Divine Love Way is firstly, pray to God about this emotion that causes you to not understand this particular principle. So let's say, we've raised many times with you the issue of meat, eating meat, right? Now, remember, at every single time I've said, don't stop eating meat if that's not what you feel like doing. So if you still feel like eating meat, continue to eat meat. But you'll never be at one with God that way. I've also said that, haven't I? Right? And I'm speaking the truth, you won't. Now, the reason why is because you're breaking a law of natural love. So if I can go down the track now saying, all right, if eating meat's breaking the law of natural love, what I'll do is I'll stop eating meat. So I'm not breaking the law anymore. Now, that is true. You can actually stop eating meat and not break that law anymore. But that doesn't change the emotion inside of you that wants meat in here, that wants meat in your tummy. Right? Well, eventually it might, after many, many years, but we want to cha make changes quite rapidly, don't we? We really want to make changes. If we're going to make a change, why not make it today and not take a year to do it? It'd be great to do it today. So with the change of eating meat, what we're suggesting is that you need to feel an emotion that's in you as to why you want meat in your body. There's an emotion in there. And there's also an opposing emotion, an emotion of error about, you know, and there might be many hundreds, in fact, of beliefs that you may have now inside of yourself, fears that you might have as to why you're eating it. For instance, uh, my mother has a very big fear about me not eating meat, which is interesting. She's got a fear about me for a start. But, <laughs> so she's got a fear about me not eating meat. The reason why she feels that I will get, you know, my system will get all depleted and, Oh, we're not getting enough protein and my muscles will waste away 
and you know, before you know it, I'm going to be bedridden and hospitalised in her mind, right? Now, her fear drives her to try to badger me to eat me. Now, how many of you have had that? And some of you may even be feeling that yourself, right? Inside of yourself, that if I give away that, my health is just going to degrade. And some of you have even given away meat in the past, had your health degrade, and then said, oh, we must need meat. Some of you have even done that, right? And yet, the true issue is always the soul-based issue. And that's the thing we want to emphasize with all of these lessons. So you notice there's the natural love ways. There's two ways you can deal with this information. One way is to do it the natural love way. And the natural love way is dealing with it here, changing or transforming your beliefs or changing or translating your belief systems. And that may actually shift some emotions. It's very true that it often does. But that's not the way I'm suggesting. The way I'm suggesting is connect to your soul work out the sole reason why you do or don't do something that's harmonious with love and let yourself clear away the error so that you can easily do it without thinking. We want to stop this process of having to be loving here, thinking ourselves loving. We want to actually start the process of actually being loved at every instance without thinking about it at all. Isn't that what you want? to actually be loved without even having to think about it. That would make the most sense, wouldn't it? So that's what we want to focus on. So you notice under the divine love way, under ways to deal with this information, I've said how to deal with it on the divine love way. The... Uh, so the Divine Love Way is pray about it, look at the causal emotion within you that creates the desire to do something disharmonious with love. Feel and experience that emotion to release it and then allow or pray for the new truth to enter you from God. So God's truth to enter you about that issue. That's the process if you like. And when you follow that process, you will automatically be loved without having to try to be loved. That's what the process you want to do. You don't want to have to try. You know, that's what every religion on earth is doing, isn't it? No. You have a long list of words and you try. I was just going to comment that even though under the divine love way it looks like you've got more work to do because there's more points, <laughs> you've actually got God on your side so it needs to be going quicker. Yeah. And it's, and it's really important to understand that the natural love way, which is this intellectual way of changing, is actually the longest way. It actually takes the longest time. And we're often fooled into it being the shortest. Like many of you have gone to different therapies and situations thinking, here's an easier way to deal with your emotions. And 10 years later, after you've tried that for 10 years, come away feeling, have I even dealt with the emotion? Right? But you were told at the start, this is an easier way. Now, I've seen many, many people do that in the last few years where they've left the path of dealing, you know, God's way, which is the way you were taught, right? It was a way inbuilt in your soul and the way you used when you were one years old. That's God's way. That's God's way of dealing with your emotions. And many of us have gotten so far away from God's way of dealing with our emotions that we have fooled ourselves into believing we're dealing with emotions when the causal emotions remain. So we need to stop that from happening. And we need to get back into this state, right, where we're childlike with this. But you don't have to do that in this, in these lessons of love. These lessons of love, they'll apply. You can do it intellectually, or you can do it emotionally. That is up to you. Right, so that's one thing I want to state to you first. You can do it how you wish. And question, maybe, can we? So can you elaborate on how to pray to God about it? And. The question was how, how to pray to God about it. And prayer, remember, what is prayer? What have I said prayer is every single time? It's a feeling or desire inside of you, directed towards God. So to pray to God about an issue, you must have a pure desire in your heart to deal with that issue. Now that's where we often run into trouble. 
Because a lot of times we haven't got a pure desire in our heart to do with the issue. We think we have. But here in our feelings, we haven't. So the feelings are the prayer. So um, if you have a very strong feeling to help a person, already you are praying for them. If you have a very strong feeling inside of you to deal with an emotion about something, you are already praying to God about that emotion. Now, you can add to that with your words, or you know, with your speech even, but in the end, if those words or speech do not come from an emotion, then it's not sincere and it can't be heard. Remember, God hears sincere prayers. So if I want to murder somebody, God's not going to help me with that prayer. Is it? Right? If I want to avoid my own emotions, God doesn't help me with that prayer. Right? Now, my law of attraction will be helped with that prayer. Like, I'll get people to help me avoid my emotions all around me. <laughs> That's what will happen automatically. But God can't help me with that. Because God wants what with you? A soul-to-soul -soul connection. That's what God wants with you. Not, not a intellectual connection. Can I ask you a question? You know, you're saying you have a feeling for something or someone. Um, do you need to have God in your life in some way for it to become a prayer? Well, obviously, if we, if it's a prayer, it's a feeling towards God about that issue. If it's, a, if it's just a, an idea or a concept or a feeling, it's just a feeling about that person. But even your feelings about other people, if they are harmonious with love, whether you are thinking you're praying to God or not, you are actually praying. This is how a lot of people receive divine love without knowing it. Because a lot of times they are actually feeling feelings about wanting this connection, this God connection, and they don't have any intellectual idea of what they're actually feeling. But God's love answers them. Does that make sense? So in the pageant messages, it's often said um, that there's a the, the distance between there and there is often so great that we have no idea of the concept of the difference between there and there in our own heart or in our own mind. So a lot of times our soul longings are there that we just don't even know them in our mind. And oftentimes too, we think we have soul longings and we don't have any at all. I'll give you an example of that. If I if I have these, if I say to myself, I want to deal with this issue with men so that, so that I can attract my soulmate into my life. And I'm a woman, let's say. I'm wanting to deal with this issue with men so that I can attract my soulmate in my life. But every time the law of attraction operates and with a man, I get angry with him. Am I wanting to deal with my issue with men? No. Anger itself is an indication I don't want to deal with it. So am I being truthful with myself? No. If I'm not being truthful with myself, am I going to ever be truthful with God? No. Now God knows the truth. But that doesn't help me there because I'm not accepting that truth. You follow me? So again, it gets back to soul design. Uh, Gloria, do you want to speak louder? Yeah. I found God to be an issue too. God to be an issue? Yeah, I found I got angry at God quite a lot of times. Yeah. Things weren't being answered, and um, I felt that it's just expectations not being met on my part. So, um, one time. Can I, can I just stop you there for a moment, though? You know how you said you felt things weren't being answered? Actually, God is answering you all the time, even when, he's, even when it sounds like silence. Right? Because what is He saying? Oh, no. <laughs> See, Often what we want is we want God to say yes all the time, right? But, but if we're going to learn God's truth, there's going to be times when we, and a lot of times obviously, when we are totally in disharmony with God's truth. And under those circumstances, He's going to be saying no. I found um, when I was truthful uh, and spoke up and said, you're not there, I'm angry at you. I had this huge experience for an hour after I got that. Like a real loving feeling, and I was yes. like amazed. It's like, holy, I spoke my truth, that angry at you. Yeah. And he, and he loved me. Exactly. Why is that? Because you were in that mode, you're in truth now. And what does God connect to? What what is the connection between me and God? It's the spirit of truth. And so that's what so if I'm really angry at God in my heart, 
and I'm saying to God, please love me, please don't. And I'm, really what I should be saying, God, I'm totally, you know, peed off with you, and I'm, you know, and I can yell and scream at you. And it always reminds me of that, uh, the movie Forrest Gump, where, where Lieutenant Dean is on the top of the mast, screaming and yelling at God in the uh, hurricane, or whatever it was. And because at that moment, he's speaking the truth, and it's a transformational thing to do that, to speak the truth in those situations. Does that make sense? So God wants you to speak truth with God, but that means you're going to have to come to terms with that truth. So a lot of times we want to believe, in fact, that oh, I want things all loving lovely with God, but in reality, I really hate God's guts. Right? To put it bluntly, like we have all these terrible feelings about God in our heart, right? We need to acknowledge the truth of that, and ironically, when we acknowledge the truth of that, that's when God can make interaction with us. So that's something to bear in mind too. Jen. Um. I have a profound difficulty with love and trust and sometimes I feel like my prayers don't get home and um, my question is, is it possible for spirits to masquerade and give you an answer oh, and certainly. a feeling and a substitute? Certainly. And then how do you know that your prayers are getting home? Well, if you have a feeling your prayer isn't getting home, then it probably isn't. Start. So as soon as you have that feeling that it's not getting home, all you need to do is go into that feeling. You need to feel that you're not being heard. What's the feeling? Nobody's listening to me. Even God won't listen to me. Go into that feeling. Process through that feeling. If you are addicted to the addiction, which we'll talk about addictions in this process, if you, if you have an addiction, which is, I want to be heard, you will then listen to any spirit who says, I'm hearing you, I'm hearing you. Right? when the relationship with God is going to be just truthful. So there are times when God is not going to speak to you because you're out of harmony. God can't speak to you when you're out of harmony in that particular instance. And that's the thing to bear in mind. So what, one of the reasons for this Lessons in Natural Love is to help you become more in harmony with the way God feels. Because these Lessons in Natural Love are, are the way God feels about a lot of things. If you can't feel you're connecting with God, you don't feel you're connecting with God because because you're not feeling anything. And and perhaps you are really angry with him, and you maybe even feel like you're entitled to be angry with him. Yes. But you don't feel angry with him. Well, then how how does how do you get that feeling through? Well, um, in another session in about uh, I think it's April, late April, I'm going to talk about anger. Now, anger, we, we often in a state of suppression of anger. And that's probably a whole separate discussion with itself, which we'll talk about then. But just briefly, we suppress our anger so much that we go into states where we believe we're not angry with somebody. But our whole law of attraction is telling us constantly that we are. The truth is, if God is not, if it appears to me that God is not listening to me, then there can only be two things happening. One is that God isn't listening to me. The other thing is that God is listening to me and I'm not hearing the response. Right? Now, most of the time it's the second. God always listens, but doesn't respond depending on what your demands are. And often we are demanding with God rather than, rather than wanting to learn from God. So look at all of the emotions that you have surrounding abundance, surrounding men and women, surrounding all of those different emotions. Like if you feel angry with men, then you're going to be angry with God as well. If you feel angry with women, you're going to be angry with God as well. Right? So there's, and if you feel like you're lacking abundance in your life, you're going to be angry with God as well. So, so allow yourself to start looking. Am I angry? Start doing the personal work to dig deeper. If I'm detuning from everything, there will be law of attraction events happening in my life showing me that I'm detuning. What would they be, for example? Well, it depends how I'm detuned. Uh, for instance, if, if my choice is to not feel my emotions, then there'll be a heap of law of attraction events going on in my life that prevent me from feeling my emotions. So that might be my life's really so busy that I can't feel an emotion. Now, if that's happening to me, and I think that's happening to you, um, your life's so busy that you can't let yourself feel, but you can't feel an emotion, then you are choosing that. You are choosing a busy life to avoid your emotions. 
So it's not acknowledging the truth of God. <sighs> I must be avoiding the emotion because my life's getting so busy again. I must be wanting to avoid the emotion. I must be wanting to get away from myself because I feel like nobody can, I can't even do anything for myself anymore. So therefore I must be wanting to get away from myself. Why is that? And ask yourself those kind of questions. Allow yourself to start seeing. And this is where your mind is very handy. It's a good tool to help you start observing yourself. But once you're observing yourself, you still need to get into the emotion. And there's a whole thing I've written on uh, the net, I think. Um, I called it re net, uh, Realizations, I think, or something like that. I can't remember what I called it. It was written quite a few years ago. Um, where I describe the process of intellectual realization, and then I describe the process of emotional realization, or soul realization. Um, I think it's under the headings of divine love, uh, divine love, forgiveness, and repentance, actually, on the net. And my suggestion is to have a read of that, because most of the time what we're doing is we're having intellectual realizations, but the soul isn't changing because the soul realizations are not occurring. And you can change that, so you have to really want to change that. But it's getting a bit of something. About how others treat others. So that's the first lesson. Does everyone understand that? Would you like to talk about the Lebanon issue? The boat, you know, the boat, the Palestinian issue. Mary's, oh, Mary's been very, very focused on the Palestinian issue. She lived in Lebanon for like nearly three years. And I, I lived in a Palestinian refugee. In a Palestinian She has a hands on affinity, affinity so. with this. Right? Yeah. Um, and she may feel a little angry when she's going through this, so we just let that happen. But um, how does that relate to this issue? I care about how others treat others. So I, um, I felt that uh, for a long time in my life that I really care about how others treat others. And I um, often got angry living in Australia because I felt like nobody cares about what's happening with other people in the world. Um, or even in the next suburb. And, um, and so I went off to be a volunteer and I, I really loved that experience and I grew a lot personally through it. And um, I really uh, connected with this issue of injustice that I saw all around me in my work, where I lived, everything. And, uh, yeah. And so when I met AJ, I, um, I had a big thing about boycotting Israeli goods because I felt that that was a loving thing that I could do. I didn't believe in violence, but that was a way of showing my support for people who didn't have any civil rights, uh, the right to vote, the right, I would talk about the refugees, and, um, and actually many Palestinians, um, a right to, to have themselves heard on, on the world stage. And I recognised that his, the Israeli interest was supported by a lot of Western interests and a lot of anti-Western sentiment. And I was, I never went to McDonald's and I drank a cup of but I was very, um, I had decided boycott was my way. Um, and uh, we had an interesting uh, altercation in a supermarket once in the UK where he wanted to buy rosemary from me. <laughs> she wouldn't let me buy rosemary from Israel. <laughs> rosemary have... wasn't a girl, by the way. So. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of emotions, not necessarily about the rosemary. Yeah. But, but we, we got to talking about what is actually loving in that situation. Because I felt I had found a loving solution to my concern about not the solution, but a, a loving way I could demonstrate my care about how others treat others. And um, I was quite resistant to hearing that that wasn't necessarily the case. But AJ pointed out that I was actually being quite selective and almost punishing of a certain group of people. Um, so if love is impartial, I would love everyone the same. And I said to him, but I'm, I'm not angry at like Jewish people, I'm not angry at Israel, I'm angry at the system that's in place and I want to change the system. He said, yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, for a start, she was angry with the group in Israel. 
And it's because of her first ever emergence. Right. And then secondly, um, changing the system doesn't get the system doesn't get changed by you adding fear to it or you adding anger to it. And that is what I was doing. So he said something that I had believed to be true for a lot of my life, um, but I had given up on um, during my time actually living in Lebanon. And that was if I change my soul condition, then that is the most powerful thing I can do for this planet. And I had passionately believed that for a lot of my life. But when I lived amongst people who I saw had, had so much injury and so much damage and were so downtrodden, I had given, so I had to deal with a lot of disillusionment with, with love and disillusionment with the world emotions. And that was actually a part of my soul condition that was preventing me from being loving. So that's the divine love way of doing it, yeah, rather than my natural love of which is the boy so that's interesting because Kelly is the second person today who's told me that they're really triggered about AJ wearing a Nike t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have been once too. <laughs> but I guess I feel pretty uh, confident that his soul condition is helping a fair amount of people on the planet. <laughs> no, I didn't even notice anymore. Well, for a start, I bought it before I knew about all those kind of things. And I don't believe in wasting it. But um, again, the more energy you focus on boycotting, um, changing things through protest, and all of these other things, you're actually giving more to these unloving events, really. You're making them bigger than they are. Because remember, in reality, they're all a reflection of your own soul condition. So the real question we need to ask ourselves on the divine love path with this issue of loving others, others loving others, we can be so judgmental, right? we can say, yeah, see, they were unloving to that person. But what about all the times I've been unloving, right, with my soul condition, holding on to my soul condition? And I'm not even thinking about that at that moment. <laughs> so what we need to do is put the focus back on ourselves, right? What inside of me creates the Palestinian-Israel system of things? There's emotions inside of you right now that create that. Ask yourself, what are those emotions? Some of you have an emotion of um, prejudicism between one or the other of those two parties. Some of you may have been harmed by an Israeli in your life, and so you have a more of a preference towards Palestinians. Some of you may have been harmed by something in the Arabic system of things, and so then you are feeling more anger towards that. Or many of you are easily influenced by the world's um, media system, which is all driven by some very, very powerful and wealthy men who have the ability to control you through that system. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so you've got to start questioning. All right, do I look at the unloving way that the media presents everything? What inside of me causes me to want to believe that rather than the truth? What emotion in me causes me to do that? If you deal with that emotion in you, you will be one less person who wants this life. Does that make sense? Yes. And in fact, as you grow in love, you become so powerful with that that hundreds or even thousands or even millions of people around you will start to look at you as a person who's now understanding the truth and they will start trying to accept that truth. How do you go towards ignorance towards it all? So instead of uh, putting some emotion into it, just uh, not uh, associating it with it all together? And that's it. Well, I'm actually suggesting against that too, right? If I want to remain ignorant about how others harm others, then am I being loving? No. no. So what I'm saying is you want to be passionately emotional about all of these things, but realize that the changes begin inside of you about these things. So, so while I have a prejudicism of one race, one color, one gender, one whatever over the other, what am I doing? I am not acting in love. Can I add to that as well? Some of the other emotions that I think are within a lot of us are emotions about an unwillingness to forgive, um, a need to be right, and they are actually core issues 
So let yourself feel the injustice that's happening in the world. I'm saying, let yourself feel it. It'll trigger some emotions in you. Let yourself feel that injustice. And understand, once you've felt those emotions, you'll get to the point where you can actually be love in every one of those situations. But it is not loving to go and you know do things that are, that are protesting or boycotting or all of those other things. You can do it. You can do it as much as you want. I'm not telling you what to do. I'm just saying, that often it's driven by an emotion inside of you, not what's going on out there, but actually inside of you. So a lot of times what we do is we feel the injustice of one party over the other, that connects with the injustice I feel about my own life, and I feel really passionate about that, not connecting to that emotionally, but I'm feeling passionate about it, and so I, I, I'm like a leech in a way, connecting to this group of people or that group of people or that group of people adding to their emotional condition, wanting an addiction satisfied within myself, when in reality what I need to do is release an emotion. So can everyone see the first issue with the first lesson there? I'm not saying don't be passionate about how others treat others. In fact, I'm saying quite the opposite. Be passionate about how other people treat other people. Right? But deal with it in the divine love way which is look at myself, see myself, see what I'm creating here in this situation. Because all of us are creating something in it. Jen? Uh, last week I was talking to a lady friend of mine and she was saying that she was Yeah, but I would make the opposite suggestion to her. Go ahead, feel about it, cry about it, because there's a causal emotion in her that feels attracted to these people's loss. And she needs to feel that emotion. And so my suggestion is watch telly every day and connect to that emotion every day until